Hello, I'm David Hunt and welcome to The Art Hunter. My artist today, listen to this, influenced by ancient cultures, science fiction and popular culture. Mm, brought a broad brush there. Exhibits uh, in Australia, New Zealand, uh, the US, has got collectors that collect him all around the world. Um, we'll talk about uh, one particular exhibition that's happening right now. Uh, and colour is a major part of this artist's life. There is an exhibition that he's just been part of in New York, so hello, you know, quite well known. It's called More Than a Toy Exhibition. We'll get to that a little bit more about being obsessed with toys. Uh, his name is Dave. I'm not happy about the fact that he's got a beautiful name like David and he wants and he calls himself Dave anyway. You know, like some of us um, do strange things. Uh, Dave <laughs> Behrens. Hello, Dave. Hi, David. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky you said David yep. then. Uh, now, we will touch on to that. You know, why are you calling yourself Dave when you've got a lovely name like David? Well, there is another artist um, in the world called David Behrens, funnily enough. Really? Yes. Um, and he is a painter in the USA. Um, and when I was looking to sort of get a domain name on the internet, um, davidberens.com was already taken. And so sort of I wanted to, I sort of did a bit of digging and realized there was another artist. Wow. Um, and so Dave Behrens was still available.com. And so I thought I'll do that and I'll just become Dave, much to my mother's disgust. <laughs> well, I, I don't blame her as yeah. well. Uh, and, and what about at home? You know, not with your mum, of course, but um, uh, at home with your partner and friends. What do they call you? It's Dave. Oh, it's yeah. Dave now? Yeah. Oh. It is. So okay. my family still call me David. Yep. Um, but I sort of, I'm sort of connected with art now. Yep. Um, and so I sort of, you know, my Facebook and all my socials is Dave. Right. And so it sort of gets to, to, to Dave now, whereas my, you know, my husband calls me David. So, you know, <laughs> so well, which is good. Or is that just when he's angry exactly. with Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Now let's talk about you as an artist. Uh, w was it um, at, at school? Did you start there, and did you, you know, like go out as a, a young adult and think, um, you know, here I am, I'm an artist? I did when I was in high school. Yep. I loved art and I loved creating. And even though my art teachers at the time said, "You've got promise," um, probably art isn't the kind of career to be getting into if you want something stable. Um, this is back in the '80s, and and yeah. um, I sort of was in a living in a country town. Um, and would have had to have sort of, you know, left country town to sort of, you know, study, study that. So I was kind of dissuaded from doing that and sort of ventured into sort of, you know, a different industry altogether. Right. And, um, and where was that country town? Was in Mirabara in Queensland. In Queensland. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, so a great little country town. Yep. Um, but sort of decided to get into a completely different industry right, okay. and forgot about art for, you know, 10, 15 years. Right. So when when did it um, uh, you know, come back into your focus? It came back into my life in 2001, um, where I just had some free time. I wanted to, I guess, start a bit of a hobby. And so I decided just to get a whole heap of different materials and have a play and just to see what, you know, what stuck and, and what didn't. I, I see in your art, which where it's over both our shoulders, is that I, I see a little bit of influence with a, an artist called Keith Herring yes. out of New York, a brilliant artist. Yep. You agree with that? Absolutely. He's a big inspiration of mine. Yeah. Um, so I, I liked his use of using lines and pattern in his work. Mm. Um, and he sort of used a paintbrush to paint his works or pens, yep. um, whereas I use paint dispensed out of little bottles and tubes. And so it's more like, uh, I guess, liken it to pi um, ice, icing a cake with, with piping. Oh, so it's it that, that fine, yep. finer bottle. So that. one millimetre whole um, tubes and I just squeeze acrylic paint out of those tubes. Dave, that would take forever. It does. And it takes forever to dry. Yeah. But the, the, out, the end result is a very tactile, almost sort of two dimensional feel. Uh, to it the would work. be because it would actually stand up like cake decorating would would be higher than the, the canvas, wouldn't it? Absolutely. And a, a funny story with regards to that, I had an exhibition um, in two thousand and seven and uh, there were some people there um, with their daughter who was actually uh, vision impaired and asked 
and you don't normally ask to touch paintings, no. but asked based on the tactile nature of the work, would it be okay if, if she could touch the work? And I said, absolutely. Um, and it, just to see the look on her face, yeah. of just touching and feeling oh, the work. She was lovely. seeing the work and it was quite extraordinary. Yeah. It's like how your work can have an impact on people that can see, but also has an impact on people that can touch. Mm. And I found that really fascinating. Yeah. So here you go, you, you start on a journey, um, you're doing it late, later in, in life. Um, how hard is that struggle? You know, like where, where does it take you? You know, like what do you do to get, you know, like to be part of a collection that's um, just been in New York? Look, I think social media has a big, you know, influence in that and a big driver to that. Yep. I think before social media and, and internet, you really only just sort of advertised through galleries and you didn't really have any any presence anywhere. Actually, that's a very valid point. Yeah. So a lot of artists found a, a great tool in mm. order to reach larger audiences very, very quickly. Yeah. Um, and with things now like TikTok and, and Snapchat, where you can show little quick little videos where yep. people's attention spans are not, you know, uh, aren't huge, something impactful for 10, 15 seconds um, can create great impacts and yeah. great exposure. And uh, and that's what your art is because it is quite pop arty, yeah. isn't it? And so the, the impact of somebody, uh, you know, like noticing it on social media would be, oh, they'd stop and, and you know, like, and investigate a little bit more, wouldn't that's they? That's right. And then they share it. Mm. You know, either they purchase it and then they send, you know, put, you know post a photo of my work on yeah. it and, and do all that, or they share a, a post and it can get it can build up an audience very, very quickly. And so do you sell the bulk of your art through social media? Yeah. You do it? Pretty much, yeah. So okay. I, I, thanks to sort of COVID last year, I sort of, there weren't any opportunities to be in galleries because we just you know, couldn't yep. even leave our house to deliver to a gallery. <laughs> um, so I opened up my own sort of online shop on uh -huh. my website. Yeah. Um, and then you know, just did some advertising through those channels. I sold some you know, um, face masks with my artwork on them, uh, just for something, for a point of difference. Um, and just found advertising through social media is, is how I made sales. Mm. And a lot of your art is, um, you know, like it, it's on a square piece of canvas, yep. uh, but it's often ovaled or triangles. Uh, yep. what, what, what are you doing here? Why are you pushing us in that direction? I, I love, well, traditional shapes are generally square or rectangle when you look at yep. artwork. Um, I love geometry and love geometric shapes. And when I came across some round canvases, I thought this, how, how good would that be to explore what art would look like on a round shape on a wall? And it just gives different opportunities for a different look. Yeah. Um, it's sort of almost like a window or a portal. Yeah. Um, and, I've, and I love that sort of effect that it had on a wall. And so did people that purchased them. It yeah. was just something a bit different different shapes that you wouldn't normally see yeah you know are, are new opportunities to explore with yeah and you know, like they're not they're not small are they your paintings they're they're fairly large about a meter yeah so yeah. generally I, I can go pretty small just yep. you know because some people have a minimal space in their in their sort of, of in their dwellings uh, whereas you know i go up to about a meter and a half is the yep. the maximum purely for space because the canvas has to lay flat and I have to paint down onto it so I can dry yeah. without running and going anywhere. Yeah. So, and how long would a, a you know, let's say, a meter square uh, painting uh, take you? Because you wouldn't you be having to stop a lot of the time. Yeah, you do. Um, you've got different factors, like you've got you know the paint um, you know might get clogged in the tube, so you've got to sort of unclog that. You do a bit of work, um, whereas. I paint very intuitively, so I don't plan a piece. I don't plan what the pattern is going to look like. Okay. Um, so I might just do half an hour and go, this is really cool. I don't know what, you know, I don't know what to do next. So I'm just going to have a break and then I'll come back to it when it's dried. So, you know, it, it, it takes, you know, a bit of time, I guess, for, um, you know, inspiration and for that to flow. Yeah. Uh, and has there been a time where, Dave, you've come back and you're going, this is crap. And, and you, you know, like you scrap it? Um, when I've, once it's, um, when I've painted it and it's still wet and I've gone, I don't like that, then I'll scrape it off. Um, 
I generally will look at it. If I'm happy with it, I'll progress on to the next part. Yep. If I don't like what I've done, oh, okay. then I've got the opportunity to scrape it off yep. and Pretty let it dry, yeah. paint over it again black yeah. and then start again. Right. Um, but I've got to make that decision really instantly if I don't like it or not. So yeah. it's always checking. When I do a line, do I like it? What's it going to look like when it dries? Then move on to the next bit. If it's something, yeah. sometimes the paint won't play properly and it'll come out in, in a big splotch and then... You know, I, I'll either use that to an effect and, and paint around it or, or, cr or make that part of the piece. Yeah. Or I just stop and go, no, nah, I, I want it to be perfect. And, and, and do you have to step away from it? A lot of artists do. You know, like if you're looking down on it, painting directly with these tiny little tubes, mm. is, is it something that you, you have to, you know, like step back every now and then and see if it's actually flowing or you're moving in the right direction or do, can you do it that intensely close? I, I really work intensely close. I right. don't sort of look back at it and see where, how it looks in context. I sort of, I love getting up close and personal to it. My eyesight's not the best, so I <laughs> need to get a bit close. And I love, I love colour as you can probably see around me. And I just love when colour comes out of the tubes, it sort of has that really good effect on the brain and, and and that's what kind of drives me to keep pushing, you know, colour relationships and different contrasts with the yeah. different colours that I use. And yeah. I love to get up close and personal whilst doing yeah. that. Now, you're, like, you're not represented by a particular gallery um, and, um, and you've actually staged a few exhibitions yourself. Yeah, so I, I have hired gallery spaces yep. um, and run my own exhibitions. So yep. I get my friends to sort of help with sales and help with the wine and the cheese and, and help me hanging the shows and stuff like that. Wouldn't that be nice? You know, like, you know, that, that's a lovely way to do it. It's a real community, um, Absolutely. isn't it? I, I think it's a really good way to learn selling. A lot of artists um, only look at the art of creating um, whereas this gets you into sort of a business sense, you know, I'm, I'm here to sell my art yep. and to, to show my art mm. and it's, it's bringing out some different skills. And mm. so I learned how to, to, one, negotiate with galleries or with spaces to hire spaces, do my advertising, um, because I don't have a team of people, you know, so, you know, I'll do my own social media, mm. I'll, I'll design my posters, but I'll go to a printer to get them printed out. Yep. So. I, there's a lot of different things you can do. I go to Coles to buy the, you know, the cheese and cut it up, and <laughs> you know, or get get mum and dad to to help with, you know, making some stuff. But um, it is a bit of a team effort, and but it's it's like a sense of achievement yeah. rather than sort of going to a gallery and say, here's my work. Hang and out. and the other thing is, you make a lot more money out of yeah. it. Um, you know, like because the galleries take a big uh, chunk do. of it, don't they? Yeah, that's right. So look, there's there's benefits to sort of being represented by a gallery, but there's also a real benefit for artists to sort of, you know, do it themselves as well. Yeah. You know? and, and a lot of artists will, I mean, I'm part of some networks here in Melbourne where we have group exhibitions. So one, you can share the costs and then share the, the ability to, to man the, the gallery yep. spaces yep. Um, and share the responsibility of doing the advertising and that type of thing. So I've met some great artists and, and, and people that I consider friends now, you know, from, from doing that. Yep. All right. It had to come. The elephant's in the room. I'm looking over your shoulder, and there are some toys. Um, there, and it looks as as we mentioned, um, uh, you know, like uh, the you know, like the tribal, the you know, like uh, indigenous. Mm. Uh, it's um, very Africanish in a way, uh, but also very contemporary. Mm. Where did that come from, Dave? You know, where was the idea of you know, like, are you part of that culture anyway, or did you think? This interests me. Um, it's something I stumbled across. Um, I hadn't really um, heard of sort of designer toy industry, um, not here in Australia anyway. I through social media I saw a friend of mine in the States that had painted, he, he had painted one of these figures and I thought how cool is this? This is really interesting and I thought how did you do that? Where did you get it? Mm. Um, and I thought how cool would it be to paint what I paint on normally a flat surface, how is it going to look on a completely three-dimensional um, surface? Basically, you, you turn the figure around and paint around the whole thing, you know. So I bought a couple of the figures from a company over in the US and, and started 
working out how I would do it. It was either going to be a success or a dismal failure. Yeah. And luckily, fortunately, it was a, a great success that, you know, that they turned out the way they did. Uh, now, again, there's a throwback there to Keith Haring as mm. well, because um, he painted a Well, he would even paint uh, Egyptian, uh, you know, like what? Uh, you know, Sarcophagus. Uh, and, yes. But he was even painting on people. He was. You know, he painted on Grace Jones. Grace Jones. Yeah. Yes. So, um, it's and and sort of looking at that, it's like it it can, it was just take longer to do because normally on a flat surface, I can sort of paint a kind of large area, whereas on a on a sort of a a seven inch toy that big, for example, I can only paint on a small area because it's flat. So I have to allow that to dry okay. for a couple of days at least. Whoa. Turn it so that I've then got the next piece of flat area to do another maybe three or four centimetres. Yeah. So it's a very long process, but the payoff at the end is something that, you know, is quite visually effective. And and it's the, the, the Japanese are really big on it, aren't they? Absolutely. Uh, and uh, South Korea as well. Yep. Is it big in America too, is it's, it? It's huge in America. Um, okay. It's, it's not so big here. The, yeah. the, there's been a couple of um, artists that have sort of um, painted on vinyl toys here in Melbourne. There was a, a, a Toy to the World project done recent, uh, a couple of years back, which I was involved in here in Melbourne, okay. where um, he, the, the curator um, got together a heap of artists to paint on one particular type of toy, with a little um, bear, um, and sold those off, and money was went to um, the Victorian AIDS Council. Uh -huh. um, so uh, raising money for that. Up until that point, no one had really heard of sort of designer toys and, and customising. Um, so now I'm sort of doing a lot more, um, a lot more people from overseas and knowing that Australians are now getting into to toy customising. And thanks to this exhibition in New York that's currently on, um, people are seeing that there's artists all over the world that actually that mm. are you know, involved in doing this. So what was it like when all of a sudden this collector uh, you know, like purchased how many? Three or four? Three or four. Three. Yeah. Uh, and then all of a sudden, you get told that it's going to be part of an exhibition. Yeah. With um, what's the exhibition called again? Uh, more than a toy. More more than a toy because it is. It's a piece yeah. of art. Uh, it must be really exciting, Dave, when something like that happens. Absolutely, um, because they wanted to show different styles from different artists in what. The, the toy actually represents. And we always think of a toy as something that a child plays with. Mm. Um, whereas a toy is something that you would have on display, essentially. You don't necessarily, I don't, I, I collect as well, you know, different artists that, that customise, um, but I certainly don't sit and, you know, play with them <laughs> in the Hello, corner of the house and talk to each other. Steve. But they make beautiful statements and, yep. and you know, based on why they paint them um, is, another reason it's a good conversation starter and, and it might represent something that you align with. Yep. Um, so you know, I think that's why they chose that title for the exhibition and why they chose a wide range of different artists because we all have our different reasons and why we design or decorate or mm. uh, uh, you know something. And how, how how is this exhibition being shown? Is it in a gallery or? It's in a gallery, yes. Yeah. So it's a physical gallery. Um, there is obviously with, with COVID um, over in the USA, there's still some restrictions, but of they course. are allowing people yep. to physically go and see it. Um, I was actually involved in an exhibition last year in Sydney, which was totally, uh, it was actually set in a gallery. Um, but it was all virtual. So yep. someone filmed it yep. um, and you could go on and then move mm. yourself around the gallery space yep. and look at the art yep. that way. Yeah. Whereas people can physically go and see it. And I think that's just so important to, yeah. for people to physically, not necessarily touch something, but to actually look at it and mm. just get a feel for it. Oh, it, it. It's so important, isn't it, to see something and instead of seeing it on a screen. It's Absolutely. much better. Uh, so all of a sudden here you are, you've been part of this exhibition. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I noticed it before we uh, chatted today about it. I noticed it on your social media. Uh, what 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 does it do now? You know, like to put you in another realm with collectors or just people that think I like this. I like this style of art. Uh, yes, it does. Because normally, when I sort of um, paint on normal paintings or normal canvases, it's sort of people that want to decorate their walls, you know, will purchase an art. It's just another 
I guess, piece of art for something to buy, they can pop it on a shelf. Or if they don't want a, a, a painting, or if they want something a little bit smaller but still yep. of my work that mm. they want to have in their in their space, and they can, it's just something different for them to yeah. have. Yeah. Um, what this also opens up is opportunities for me to actually design for some of these toy companies. Mm. Um, my ultimate goal is to have my work physically made in a production of these particular types of toys. Oh, so, okay. Um, so there are a lot of artists that currently design and they're chosen to have their work physically made and, and printed or painted onto the artwork right. and produced as a limited edition series of about 150 or 200 pieces. Yeah, yeah. So this just helps my exposure of customising to be considered for that type yeah. of type of work because when I first looked at um, your art not so much the toys but your your other work because of the details so so beautiful I actually thought that you were a graphic designer and you were actually digital yeah yeah so no, it's it's I love raw materials and I love what paint can do and how it behaves um, a lot the stuff with my with my acrylic paint um, it has air in it so sometimes little air bubbles will actually come to the to the you know the top of the work as the work ages mm. um, and so I kind of find that's using raw materials is such a, a, a great uh, medium to, to use yeah. because it can act so differently in different environments. But you are studying right now yes, and, yeah. you're like, and we're talking about the digital world that you're looking at maybe moving into that. Why? Yeah. Um, I guess again other opportunities for, for doing something a little bit different. Um, what I would love to move into is designing for vinyl toys. Mm -hmm. And in that instance, you actually have to make put your design on a digital model, so to speak. And so I'm working on 3D models, you know, digitally yeah. um, to, to create that so that you know, art, uh, toy companies can see what it looks like. They can see what it looks like when I paint it, but then to be actually physically produced, you actually have to design it digitally. So mm -hmm. I'm learning those skills just to give some other, I guess, tools in the toolbox on yeah. how to create. But would you ever mo move away from uh, your little tubes of paint? Uh, you'll stick with that? Yeah, oh, absolutely. I think the, the digital is just another component to my creative mm. practice. Yep. Um, I love just creating in, in normal um, acrylic paints. The, the beautiful thing that I'm studying at the moment is I'm, I'm you know, starting to learn watercolours. I haven't used watercolour oh, before. Okay. And so I'm creating some different work and different looks from watercolour, yep. but also trying to create it using my own style, which mm. is very interesting. So mm. I'm looking at different things. So l I've never considered it before, but it's being introduced to it. It's like, oh, could I use this in my practice? And well, because all the all the great artists they they they've done that, you yeah. know, like they, they'll work in watercolors and then um, you know oils, yep. uh, and it's through the the ages it, it's happened, and, and I think you, uh, with with a lot of artists they challenge themselves, and like a lot of uh, when photography first came out, uh, they were challenged with that, and so mm. they went down down that road as well. Yep, yeah, and you know like. So therefore, you know, like you working in um, watercolours, I find fascinating because I can't see how you could produce what you do. The thing is, um, I, I look at, because we have to do certain exercises when we're studying and using watercolours and, and I'm just experimenting, which, which is what I did with acrylic paint, which drew me to this style. Yeah. Um, so, but what I've done is I'm experimenting with watercolours on how I can try like using an eyedropper and different things oh, to sort of, and, okay. and using, because obviously with the, with how I paint, the paint has to be of a thick consistency yeah, to do what it does. Yeah. But you can still, you can, you can, you can use your watercolors, obviously use your water to, you know, to sort of, you know, make it like a watercolor, I guess, but you can, I could put other mediums in it to actually thicken it a little bit. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Not to the point of acrylic paint, but just to try things. Yeah. I think that's what, artists should do is always exploring mm. new ways to, to do things well immediately you've told me now because I was thinking water paint that would you know like how could you do it mm. but now you've told me mm. you know like thicken it you know yeah. like don't make it as watery yeah uh, and yeah you know like so an artist's brain is it's very different to somebody like me who has no idea <laughs> but I, I can see and appreciate art but you know like do you find that that your brain is a little bit different to a, an average person? 
I, I think must be, I think, <laughs> because when I, I look at stuff, I mean, I, I'm always like, I like to call myself an explorer and I like to play with things to see how they work. Um, whereas I'd rather, I'd rather have that time to spend on, on playing with a medium to see what happens, you know, and if something doesn't happen quite right, I'd love to learn that mistake, if that makes sense, because I'd rather, you know, go on the journey on how something works, if that makes sense. And, and so allowing to use these mediums for different effects is, is quite fascinating. And, mm. and that's what actually what I love to do, to love about being creative. Mm. So here we are, you're, you're looking <coughs> at digital, uh, the, the toys fascinating uh, you, um, looking at uh, water uh, colours. And uh, is there one other area that you think to yourself, I'm not now because I'm, I'm busy. I've got all these other bits and pieces I want to do. Is there something down the track that you think, oh, I, I, I must try that one day? Yeah, drawing. Oh. Because um, I'm doing a lot of drawing at the moment. Um, even in the digital world, we have to sort of, you know, do little thumbnail sketches of things and then, you know, bring them to life in a digital realm. So I'm doing a lot of drawing and I never considered myself a drawer um, when I, you know, 10, 15 years ago, and I probably still don't consider myself one now, but we yeah. all draw, it's to what level. And, and I've been told, you just practice every day. It's like anything, you just practice. No, no I'm no. stopping you there, no. <laughs> um, yeah, like my stick men don't even look like stick men. I go, Yo, what have I done? I think it's something that as I spend time on different mediums, it's just something that I need to spend time with. Um, whereas um, I, right now I don't have that time, but from doing drawing now in, in my various different capacities, I'm finding it's actually getting a little bit better. Mm. Um, I still love people that can, you know, life draw and can actually draw a beautiful figure of someone's, you know, posing in front of them. Yep. I can't see that. As in, I can see them, but I can't translate it. And yeah. that's something I'd love to develop. Well, or study. Yeah. You know, like that, that's the other. I, I think it's important that an artist never stops learning. That's right. And to study. I, I, so many artists that I know, you know, like go off to the south of France and, and do landscaping, which, you know, like they use it as a holiday, but, uh, and I learn how to landscape paint. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's the the, the the doing the study last year is certainly was a an opportunity um, thanks to COVID to learn something new and I'm just running with it I'm, and I'm having an absolute ball with it mm. uh, so so many things um, let, let's go back to the to the toys uh, it, you know like will this last the the toy thing because it's been around now for quite a few years hasn't it it has um, maybe in Australia it's not quite a well-known thing. So, so it would develop here, I, I think? I think so. And I think, you know, something I would love to do is sort of organise more exhibitions of just toys, pretty much what's happening now in, in New York, mm. you know, with an exhibition of all different artists of toys. I'd love to do something like that or, or you know, find, you know, some like-minded people. I don't really know a lot of artists that do customise on customised toys, but, you know, I'm sure a bit of networking... Um, would uh, sort of, you know, might yield some nice results. Yeah. Um, I still think there's a, 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 there's still a lot of legs in the industry. Right. Um, I think the, the, there's a lot of things, like the toy companies love this uh, limited sort of thing, we're limited capacity, so people love to collect. Mm. And so people will collect normal production toys. Um, and then be open up to what other artists are doing to them. Mm. Um, it's sort of just opening up new audiences mm. for, for, for these types of things. So I, I can see, and I, it would take you s such a long time with uh, the way you describe that you can only do a little section, you've got to wait for a day or two before the, the paint dries, um, for you to actually do a toy exhibition yourself of, say, 50 to 100 pieces, or would that be too much like hard work? Well, I've probably I've got the pieces now oh, already you've got done. Them. Yeah, so it would just be a matter of you know organising an exhibition just of of that, finding a space and getting a lot of plinths in and, and doing it. You know, I've got the ability to do it. Um, yeah. it's just a matter of means of finding. You know, Have you ever thought of doing it? Just oh, a yes. toy one. Yeah. yeah, yeah. 
just on, as toys on their own. Yes, yeah. because I've often thought about combining it, showing this is this is all that I can do. Yep. But I think just to introduce people just to a different medium, yeah. um, I think would be a nice focus. Be, because I can see it, you know, like on the end of a bookcase or mm. on a, um, you know, like or on top of a TV set, even yeah. on, on off to one side. Um, you know, like they're interesting, they're f- and they're fun, and and but they're beautiful pieces of uh, of of art as well as being a bit of fun at the same time. Absolutely, and I think some people, especially adults, don't like to call them toys, mm. but they are. You know, it's a toy. Um, I guess in the traditional sense, you don't play with it, but you appreciate it, mm. um, and. You, I still have a few toys, especially Lego, that I had as a kid because I might not necessarily play with it anymore, but it's still very, very sentimental yep. um, and, and evokes a lot of memories about childhood and family. Um, so it's and they're displayed along with some of the other toys that I collect. So yeah, but Lego, it's so cool. <laughs> it is, but you can even create, you know, like artistic pieces with Lego. So it's another medium in itself yep. that, you know, it's not just about a house, you can create yep. some wonderful sculptures. Who yeah. would have thought that Lego would actually have action movies? Yeah. You know, like all the, the you know, like, and it's, they're funny. Yeah. You know, and it's, uh, it's weird. Hey, y- yours could be in one of the next, um, uh, you know, Lego movies. Absolutely. As a villain or something. Could very well be. I mean, there's, there are, there's a lot of opportunities. Artists are actually doing that, that are, creating animated figures similar to these, you know, where, you know, you may see them pop up in a in an animated show in the not too distant future. So yeah. there's there's a lot of opportunities for, you know, these types of platforms to, yeah. to reach. And even to the extent, and uh, and again, Keith Herring would do a similar thing, a, a model as in, you know, like the, the figurine model that you see uh, in shop windows with clothing on it. Yeah. You've... You've painted uh, them as well. I've painted full-size mannequins. Yeah, that yeah. that's been a huge undertaking. But again, it's it's amazing. It's like they've almost got like a a, a different you know kind of skin. It's almost like they're wearing a leotard with this pattern on them. Yeah, it's yep. it's physically painted on there. And have you uh, they've been for sale, or do you have them for yourself, or have you sold them? No, there's some I've sold. Um, the one that's sort of the I think the one that you may have seen where I'm sort of posed behind it, it's it's sitting in a cupboard at home actually, but you know, it's it's up for sale. Because um, that could come out when you do the exhibition on the toys. Oh, absolutely. Hey, yeah. hello. There's I an think idea. we've got your exhibition. <laughs> now stay tuned people, because there's an exhibition coming up. <laughs> Dave, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. And I, and I just love the detail and the work that you put into your art. And it's obviously very time consuming, isn't it? It is, absolutely, yeah. Okay. But rewarding. Rewarding. Yeah. I'm David Hunt, and you've been watching The Art Hunter, and you'll see us again real soon.